Hooray! Ta-da! Ta-da! Welcome to season three of To Boldly Watch. It looks different in here. It's season Ooh. three. Ooh. Wow. Did we get new uniforms? I think we my did. back doesn't hurt so much. There's a collar. My crotch is more padded. <laughs> my crotch is more padded? You've been padding like it lightly different. and now doubled the padding? Season three, baby. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Season three. <laughs> Oh, I just can't get over you patting your crotch, but okay, great. Yeah, season three. This is amazing. We made it to season three, you guys. This is when I think most people agree Star Trek The Next Generation starts getting consistently good. Yeah, it well, comes into its own. Yeah, I think I think that's that's the feeling. It comes it comes into its own. I think that's a great way of saying it because it they kind of get their own rhythm. Um, before we like jump, like a into teenager that gets a gray uniform and huh? his mom back on the ship. Very true. Before we like delve into the first uh, episode of the season, Evolution, let's talk just a little bit about season three in general. So obviously we're going to talk about the return of Beverly Crusher. Dun, dun, uh, dun, 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 dun. She plays Diana Mulder as Pulaski. Um, what? And, and just, no. Go but to I replace. I thought yeah. you said who plays. Right. Yeah, Rupert. Crusher sure like is that. playing Pulaski this season. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Gates would crush that. She's so good. She's such a great actress. Oh, that would be an interesting casting. God, interesting. what if she played Pulaski now? <laughs> oh, oh, God. That'd be oh. so cool. Is it anyway. just like in Search Party when Portia plays Dory? <laughs> <laughs> that is such a uh, really quick plug for that show. That show is amazing. Oh, Are wow. you watching the new Please season? Watch. Yeah, I'm, oh. I'm like a couple episodes behind, but Search Party is fantastic. I highly recommend it. Oh, yeah, you'd like it, Xander. I mean, if you don't like shows about really evil people, maybe it's not for you. But if that's your bag, this yeah. is your show. Yeah, the that's protagonists the right are, aren't the best people. They're semi-anti-heroes in some way. But they're also, like, <laughs> painfully wonderful. I don't know how to <laughs> describe them. God. Painfully wonderful is right. <laughs> Elliot, little spoiler, Gay man who starts hosting like a Fox News show just because oh, no. he wants the, the fame. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, their nar his narcissism is, is pretty knows no ends. His choice, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's great. Um, but back to Star Trek, uh, season three, we get a little bit of changes uh, in kind of not really beyond casting of Crusher. We also get like the uniform change has noticeably happened. We have the spandex gone mm -hmm. for the most part, and we have these new little also, more Also, I was gonna see if you had noticed this too, but you could definitely tell a soundtrack change. Oh, no, I this, hadn't really oh, pulled that. It's totally different, especially if you watch like a season two episode back to back, It the synth is like cranked up I to was 11. gonna say, it's that little synth keyboard sound. Yeah, <laughs> and this is very Star Trek to me. This sounds like the next generation mm -hmm. sounds. Mm -hmm. So I think they went away from that sweeping orchestra of the original series and mm -hmm. found the bleeps and bloops that we've come to love. Yeah, the orchestral. Yeah. <laughs> A different okay. <laughs> That's all one tone, Becca. So yeah. <laughs> no melody in there. Uh, I heard the theme song. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean the yeah the orchestral sweep has kind of been toned down, right? It still has yeah. like strings and stuff, but it's totally. much more subtle. Yeah, it's I agree with that. Forward. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, well, speaking of songs, also we I mean the the main theme has stayed the same, but we have a new opening credit sequence. Uh, we are no longer in the Terran system where we're looking at Earth and I Mars. I didn't even and notice because I skipped the intro. I generally skip the I intro too, but this is one of the first times I watched Oops. it. Oh, you haven't watched it either, Becca? Uh, it's got that. Twenty seventy nine. <laughs> What's happening? Shh. We have Do you not watch the episode while we're recording? <laughs> <laughs> oh, now I see this happened. Uh, we get that blue nebula. We get kind of a more alien space that's that's foreign to our eyes. So we kind of it better exudes the uh, exploration aspect of the sure. show. Okay, but it is the Enterprise moving slowly, so yeah. that that remains Just the same. In different places. Yeah, the sequence is largely the same, but instead of it, uh, when it goes by planets and stuff, instead of it being stuff from our solar system, it's new uh, life and civilizations. It seems like to me, a uh, series that run for a long time. It by the third series, they their third season, they tend to change the intro. Especially it's it, in Star Trek. I think they've done it, especially with Enterprise. Yeah. 
Yeah, no, that's true. I th- I'd say with most TV shows that like at least last a minimum of five to six seasons, there's there tends to be a real ramp up and settling in around season three. This is a generalization, by the way. Not every yeah, show yeah. follows this format. Uh, and then like it's always like season four is the best one is what a lot of people always sure. say for so many shows. Uh, we'll see if that's true for this one. I'm not really yeah. sure. Well, I'm a big fan of the clips of main characters in the ensemble doing various things with looks just past camera. Because then you get the fun game of figuring out which episode each one came from. So oh, <laughs> that is that a is fun, a fun game. game, but if <laughs> that's only if it's clips from the episode. There's also right. like that that um, motif of the '80s and '90s where they would be doing a task that their character would normally do, then they'd look up to camera and kind of like. I think Smile. Full House, Full House. Really did that. Full yeah. House or like Family Matters. A lot of right. sitcoms did that yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah. Well, what is this if not a sitcom in space? It's <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> me. Oh, that's true. It does say here sitcom in space. That's yeah, okay. Yeah. Fair point. Fair point. There are situations and they're <laughs> comical. <laughs> um, this is also when I believe some cast members start directing episodes. I know Jonathan Frakes, oh. who directs a lot of Star Trek in the future, uh, I think his first directing uh debut was in this season let me check oh. yes uh the offspring which we'll discuss down the road here that uh, sounds a lot like uh troy is going to get impregnated <laughs> by a right? spirit and you then uh, hmm. yeah the, chi- the other child yeah. yeah i would like to withdraw that this is a sitcom sorry i know we've moved on but there's no laugh track and that is a qualifying feature for me and now we can actually move on Okay, great. The Thank laugh you. track's name is Wesley Crusher, okay? <laughs> <laughs> well, let's lead in with that because he opens our season. The, our, the season opener is a shot of his messy laboratory and his little sleeping face. Aww. And we see that he is aged to 17 years old now. And he we is, can uh, see that. <laughs> yeah, we can. We can see. I mean, uh, yeah. their first shot, they're playing with close-ups and fancy camera work. Yeah. Um, but this kid is 17 and they're doing a close-up not meant to be seen in HD. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, feel feel well, bad for Will for the yeah, shot. I'll, I'll go through acne, but I thought they did a good job of like covering up as best they could. But like that's also part of just being a teenager is you yep. just break out all the time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but uh, he is working hard and well, he's sleeping and then realizes he's late for duty, and so he rushes up to the bridge where Riker has called him because they are exploring a binary star collision or explosion stellar explosion to be triggered when the egg drops (laughs) oh i see the dr stubbs is in the house already (laughs) it is i the doctor of stubbs should i keep going (laughs) this research means so much to you i've I've been hatching this egg for 300 years please launch it that analogy only lasts for like the first act when he's like uh i guess Mm -hmm. this what did he say something about it just be he laid a dud or something like that and then we just kind of move on what was that supposed to do observe the actual phenomena or record it like i kind of missed that in the ending yeah i think it was recording the the phenomena because this particular one only happens every so often yeah but it's reliable it's the old faithful of space or something he called it yeah Yeah. um so we realized that uh something's gone wrong though there is a it's not even an interference from outside like we believe or something like that but the ship starts malfunctioning to a point where it starts drifting and shields aren't responding yeah and then the computer just starts playing ganyam style (laughs) yeah the computer's a little scamp It's it's malfunctions seemed so like mischievous. It's like, okay, you want to do something? I'm just gonna start yelling chess moves at you. Yeah. <laughs> it was super evil. Why would the computer turn on them like this? It doesn't make any sense. Yeah. It's oh. never happened because the computer's supposed to be self-correcting and it doesn't even know the things it's doing. And it's so embarrassing because you have a, an important scientist coming on board and your computer is malfunctioning. Uh, yeah. Talk and you're the flagship, too. Yeah. <laughs> Truth. Uh, there's also what seems to be a new set on the bridge. And we see a fancy shot of the medical bay through some pink and blue beakers. It looks like a real hit place to be. Lots of med techs. <laughs> uh, what do you, th- wait, what, what new spot on the bridge are you referring to? It may be a new angle or it looked a little Yeah, bit it was from behind. Mm. Felt totally new and different. From behind? Wild. Toward the view screen? 
Yeah, towards the view screen. But Where I think were it was you? From the turbo lift <laughs> section or, or something. It was, yeah. I, I know what you were saying. It okay. was very centered, very Wes Anderson. Oh, 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 I get what you're saying. Okay. Symmetrical. I, I, I missed that shot, but I, now I'm eager to go back and look at it. Um, yeah, what a what a crazy start to an episode. And then like we we kind of we kind of just jump into it full on without actually knowing what's occurring. It becomes a mystery really quick. But we also get to see that Beverly Crusher with a new hairdo has arrived. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there was a lot of inner of turbulence when we jump into it quick in the bridge and they got some new Disney ride mechanics going on. <laughs> More than just a little shaky cam, yeah. like the whole hydraulic system. I think we've talked about this before, but whenever the actors have to uh, portray that the ship is being shook, they all have to kind of like leap around in their seats a little bit and do the rocking motion, right? I have uh, heard that uh, they got really good at it at next gen and, uh, Picard or not Picard, uh, Patrick Stewart would like get everybody on rhythm so that they. Call, yeah, look like... I I feel that's what you have to do is you kind of have to sway left, sway right, otherwise it looks too messy. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah it probably had a cadence to it, but I I will say, Doctor Stubb. Should we practice? <laughs> sure. Oh, please lead us, Becca. Five, six, seven, great. eight. Uh, left. Left. Wait, my left or your right? <laughs> uh, center. Uh, back. Go. Front. Welcome right. to the podcast. Left, back, <laughs> front, back. Oh, I wasn't going to my directions. We explode. There's a stellar explosion. <laughs> mm. Cool. That good job. Sense. If that gets edited together, it won't look like we're under- Well, maybe if we shake the frame, we'll see. We'll work on that. <laughs> it looked like it, it, the starship was taking sharp turns and we're like, whoa. whoa. <laughs> Did you guys see Stubbs' fall compared to everybody I, else? I wrote down Dr. Stubbs is having a bad tumble time. My goodness. Tumble time. Like it was that's a stu- lot. That stunt actor was going for it for yeah. sure. <laughs> Well, he did this, like a triple role. The actor that plays Dr. Stubbs I, is like a character actor, right? I recognize him from a billion things, I think. Or at least uh, he just I, has one of those faces. Yeah, his name is Ken Jenkins. I, he does have one of those character faces. I yeah. completely From agree. Jeopardy? <laughs> yeah, the Jeopardy champion. <laughs> oh, yeah. It does kind of sound like Ken Jennings. Yeah, yeah. Ken Jenkins. Mm-hmm. Um, he has been on a variety of things, but I'm not actually sure if we can characterize him as a character oh. actor. Oh, I want bad. to, though. Let's find out. Um, oh, yeah, he's a lot of character actors. <laughs> I checked play playback. You guys didn't mention that uh, Stubbs was squirming around on the floor. Yeah. Yeah. Thing. He it was, was all bad. over the place. <laughs> it was a lot. Cool, 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 cool. <laughs> uh, going back to Crusher being back, I really like how they handled this um, because there is that that uh, sort of monster of the week format to Star Trek. They could very easily have just been like. Crusher's back. She's been back for a while. The end. But they do really get into it. What it was like when she wasn't there. The, there are repercussions for her not have, having been there. Uh, and what does that mean for their relationship moving forward? And it becomes a central theme to like a B-plot. Yeah, she's got bad mom feels. And she's got to talk to Picard about it. And they instantly get their chemistry back in the room. Mm. <laughs> Needed. Yeah. Well, Patrick and they, Stewart probably requested this scene. <laughs> that, well, that's what I'm saying. Is like I'm really glad they gave them this scene, especially that they gave Patrick Stewart the opportunity to say, uh, "What did he say?" Like I'm sure it Dad was very stuff. difficult for you to be away. Yeah. It was less about the Wesley thing; it was more about her and about yeah. I, I know it was hard on you to be away. And she's like, "Yeah, it was." And they share a very silent moment, and that is definitely a, a nod to reality, not right. just the Star Trek thing. That's like. I'm glad you're back. And then she's like, I'm happy oh, to she be She missed a whole two inches of him, <laughs> which is a cute line. Yeah. <laughs> uh, as, soon as, as soon as she said that line, I just, in my notes, just wrote, don't Xander. <laughs> I, I wouldn't. <laughs> He's a child. Yeah. <laughs> but teenage Xander, you do what you got to do. Right. Who knows? <laughs> Oh wow! Yeah, but I'm glad to have her back. Her her energy, and uh, I like I like the the mother son dynamic here wasn't too cheesy. I actually yeah. really bought it, especially because she was genuinely trying to connect with him, and then he has a legitimate reason for being a I mean a jerk to her because he's so stressed out about what has happened. I well, that's like, later in the episode. Yeah. There's more to deal with here. That's true. Um, so 
Crusher's wondering, or Bev, Bev is wondering, Bev. like, what's his deal? Yeah. Um, she's learning from Picard all the hot gossip about how good he is at being this um, ensign. No, acting he's acting ensign. ensign. Uh -huh. And um, but but she's like, yeah, but what about his love life? What about his friends? Doesn't he hang out? Isn't he a normal seventeen year old? No, he's not. He gets along way too well with his mother. And <laughs> fun, just fun fact, which she thinks is weird too. Fun fact: um, he's earning Starfleet Academy credit it for his time on the enterprise pretty cool that's like ap yeah, yeah like running start or warp start i guess it's called that is also <laughs> just totally a plot device of like don't worry we know we mentioned the school thing he's getting credit for this <laughs> like we haven't forgotten i'm uh, glad they did i needed yeah. that information right well it's kind of also a, a, a cool choice to not just make him a a, a an ensign and make him just another regular crew member. It's kind yeah. of it's kind of cool to latch on to the fact that he's still developing and give him that. I like that. Yeah. It is yeah. also a little unfair to other cadets because this is like um being, you know, a child actor in Hollywood because your parents were in the biz and then you right. always have a leg up because you your already have the medical, contacts. Your yeah. mom's med chief medical officer. Well, or head of Starfleet Medical. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. Coach position. He gets to be on the flagship. Running the helm, even. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you believe it? Not this kid. Fit. Nepotism. But um, it definitely still provides that foil for that demographic of kids who are watching Star Trek being like, that could be me. This is... You know, someday I could be picked up by the Enterprise and I'll be the helmsman. And he's also not like a just out of puberty teenager. Now he's actually like kind of more manly looking or like more adult looking, I should say, which sure. is I think even it's easier for kids to look up to people like just slightly older than them and where, right. they, be where they will be as opposed to where they were. Um, so that's Great that was point. a nice change. Um, so the computer continues malfunctioning. We learn about Stubbs's obsession with the binary star explosion and how it's very important for him to be here to witness it. Now, this kind of comes up a, a very soon about um, like this baseball metaphor that he has for like he like recreates <laughs> being there just by like living in the statistics of it but yeah i blocked all this out because it's baseball statistics and yeah. you know here's the thing that i want to bring up about this it's the opposite of his problem though because he mm. literally he says you don't need to see it you can just recreate it with the statistics but his whole plot point is he wants to stay here to witness the thing that he is analyzing uh full of contradictions well i think that there's a point here of uh pr proving results you know, it's one thing to play the game in your head and another for it actually to turn out that way. Mm -hmm. So I could see this being a point of he thinks this is all correct and the readings could be used to prove other theories that he has. But he needs that hard data of he needs yeah. to be there to see it happen, to make sure that he can prove without a shadow of a doubt that these things are. Or Point or of order. Did you just say hard data? <laughs> I did. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but like they're measuring it with instruments. They aren't looking at it with their eyes. They're looking right. on a view screen. And like if they have probes or they have his egg to measure all this stuff anyway, what does it matter if the ship's in the solar system? Yeah. And right. if you're not at the baseball game, it better be because you chose to stay at the bar and meet the love of your life because you're Robin Williams and Goodwill Hunting. Oh, <laughs> and not because the computer's a little scamp playing tricks on you. Yeah, right? Are we talking about the same thing? <laughs> I don't know if we are, but like, let's go back to that baseball analogy real quick because that's actually a good example if you're not there. I know, Becca. But we'll hear it. So, so for those of you that are listening, Becca made her eyes really wide when I said the baseball analogy. Now, I, I don't think any of the three of us are baseball fans, right? Is that I fair wrote to say? In my notes, no more baseball. Wah. Right. And most Star Trek. I like hot dogs and I like frozen <laughs> lemonade. <laughs> Same. I love a ballpark, Frank. So, like, I share your guys' uh, apathy oh, towards Royals. baseball. And I think most Star Trek viewers are also like who cares about baseball we love space and so uh not that there I'm aren't Benjamin star trek Cisco. fans well not that there aren't <laughs> star trek fans who are also baseball people right so just, we just have to kill them <laughs> setting that aside yeah, for a where second are we going? especially the statistics side of baseball which i think is its own thing i yeah, i, I want to never let jake get to his point <laughs> i don't think i don't think it's even relevant anymore no <laughs> the reason i want to talk about it is because he mentions the shot heard around the world do you guys know what that is wasn't that the paul revere yeah <laughs> revolutionary war 
It is about the rev. The, it comes from a Walf, uh, I think an Emerson poem, maybe Ralph Waldo Emerson, oh. uh, which is yeah, it's about the Revolutionary War. But it became more popularized about the Grand Slam that happened in relation to a baseball game in the fifties. I want to say is that like a home run? That is a home <laughs> run. Oh my god! Wait, is this at Denny's? Like <laughs> <laughs> average. The reason it was so famous is because um, it was against the New York Giants and the Brooklyn Dodgers, and they were rivals because they both are in new york right yeah and they were fighting for the pennant which is like just before the world series so they're fighting it's for their division flag. and the dodgers brooklyn had been crushing all season and the giants were slowly catching up to them but it's pretty much just those two and they they were slated to lose and so back then the tenant was the best of three games the pennant was the le- the best of three games mm-hmm. so it was the third game the bottom of the ninth inning, which is the last opportunity, okay. the score is four to two. That's after the seventh inning stretch, was it? Which is one of the Where other things that I know of. Good. <laughs> That's two facts you've gotten out about baseball. You're doing great, Becca. Uh, <laughs> so then, the it's four to two. The series is tied one one. This is this is for it. And like, there's I believe I don't know if the outs are out yet, but the bases are loaded, and the third baseman comes up, and. He knocks it out of the park to win the game by one point and instantly shuts the series out and the Giants win. This was the one of the first television broadcasts of a baseball game ever, and it was played on the radio all over the world during the Korean War. Uh-huh. So like people overseas who were in bunkers and stuff were listening to this game. Huh. And so it was actually heard around the world in a lot of ways because people were really intense about it. And a lot of overseas people from New York were very excited to hear that their team had beat their rivals. <laughs> or um, the way around. Yeah. And so <laughs> the, the I want to read just a quick quote that was given to um, one of the radio broadcasters who broadcast the um, the actual recording. Uh, one of a Korean veteran wrote to him and he said, let me see if I can get it. Way to go. You he said, thank God there baseball. was only one thing we could listen to instead of a billion news channels, <laughs> most of which are absolute bunk. So like 40 years after this ha- this happened, the, the baseball player who hit the Grand Slam got a letter from a Marine who was stationed in Korea in 51. And he said, I was in a bunker in the front line with my buddy listening to the radio. It was contrary to orders, but he was a Giants fanatic and he never made it home. And I promised him if I ever got back, I'd write to tell you about the happiest moment of his life. Wow. It's taken me this long to put my feelings into words. So on behalf of my buddy, thanks, Bobby. And like. <laughs> Wait, you didn't put your feelings good. into words. There were no feelings there, bud. I'm sure the letter was not. Oh, okay. <laughs> But like, even if we aren't baseball fans, I think we all appreciate a really passionate game, and we also appreciate fandom, and that's what I think that I'm meant for a lot up. of people. I know, right? <laughs> I've that's never not what up. I got from Doctor Stubbs at all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, his his version of it wasn't as great. <laughs> <laughs> sitting there in his in his apartment, just being like, "All right, this guy's on first, mm-hmm. this guy's on second. <laughs> I mean, I do the same thing, but it's something else. <laughs> 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 All right, back to Spain. Hi, Mom. Grand Slam. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I have filled my food slot this morning with some <laughs> toast. Good. I just like that Beverly called the malfunctioning replicator a yeah. food slot. That's yeah, right. they call I think they call them food slots in various points and also call them replicators at various points. I yes. think it's like food specific replicators or yes. something. Yes. Because if I was replicating dangerous equipment or radiated radiation, I wouldn't want that mixed with the food that I would Mm. replicate. So it's all being replicated by the replicator, but some of it is specifically a food slot. The danger replicator is the other one. The danger replicator. (laughs) Uh, Let's pause for a second. Let Oshi know about the recording. (laughs) <laughs> so for those of you that don't know becca's just muted her mic and we just see her mouth yelling and it's so great oh here he comes oh, no. special appearance oh goodness hey bud we're recording so if you could be chill thank you oh, yeah we can't pay God. the fee for him speaking so it's he's fixed. just gonna be a visual extra he's gonna be an extra yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay <laughs> Well, uh, Wesley realizes that he is probably the cause of this because he goes back to his lab and he finds that his experiment is missing. Well, first, there's a moment between Stubbs and Wesley. They share a chosen one moment. Wunderkind. Yeah. (laughs) Where he calls it Wonderkind. And it's like, 
he kind of does a German accent, but number one rule of Germany, Aleman, <laughs> you got to make the W's V's. That's the number German one Aleman. rule of this country of Germany. <laughs> the uh, also, I like Nazis are bad is number <laughs> right. two. <laughs> and we're all going to admit that and the government's going to not oh. be cool with you being down with the Nazism. That's an important thing about Germany. Go Germans. <laughs> Definitely put. Uh, the <laughs> the thing about it is, like, I guess, you know, language evolves. I was surprised Wesley even knew what German was, actually, because they all speak like this human English, right? Uh, out yeah. in the States. Well, they all sort of play up these sort of earth conversations that I think writers are just trying to get in. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, the John Philip Sousa thing, people are like, yeah. what is this nonsense, right? Right. Uh, but you you make a good point, Becca, is they, the, 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 wonder, the Wunderkind is talking to, I guess, the chosen one, which I'm surprised Wesley didn't drop in there. He's like, well, mm -hmm. okay, sure, you're, you're a smart guy, but, you know, I'm kind of the chosen one. He doesn't know he's the chosen one. Only right. Picard knows oh, in the Traveler. Right. Okay. Um, he fine. said some really great things to Wesley, which is achieving early in life is a burden. Mm -hmm. You know, now you're always going to try and fulfill your potential, and your potential will be your greatest adversary. Who can relate? <laughs> I am raising my hand. We're all uh, yeah. Yeah. Audience, you should be raising your hand as well. Right. Yeah. It's your greatest adversary. I think that this this is coming from like a salty ex Wunderkind who uh, is just sees himself and like this is my chance to tell my younger self all the things that I wish I would have known or done, uh, basically that made me an asshole as an adult, so that I could develop that early. I mean, being told you're a Wunderkind is like really troublesome because it, like it just puts it puts you in the realm of expectations as opposed to just being in the realm of creativity right you sure. worry about I think he knows that he's not like his peers <laughs> yeah he's the only one in a gray uniform that used to be rainbow <laughs> i i know but like that's not don't wouldn't it be better to like not always be addressed as special so well, I think this this can boil down to like the the ambition of a straight A student who you know during school is working extracurriculars and other jobs and things like that. So it could be seen as, I mean, I remember growing up, especially with the character of Wesley, I really related to you know I had drama practice and I had band class and I had da 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 da, -da on top of my schoolwork that I was working on twenty four seven. So. I get that, like that ambition, and I feel so badly for him in this episode. I remember at the at the time, and even now, of how things went down. I just feel for Wesley. Wait, so tell me, what do you mean you like? I understand what you're saying that you identify with him, but when you were a kid, you really deal did feel that you're you were kind of paralleling his story a little bit. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, because I was involved in every extracurricular in school mm -hmm. and tried to get good grades in every subject, and you know what I mean. Like I was just yeah. trying to be that gifted and talented student that I was told I was at an early age. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fulfilling those expectations. Okay, here's my advice to all of the Wunderkind teens <laughs> listening. Really just squander it early sure. and um, smoke a lot of weed after school. Mm -hmm. And your mom will make you sign up for one extracurricular and it's going to be uh, Bye Bye Birdie. And then sure. you're going to find your calling in life, which I is to be an bye -bye extra. Birdie. In a musical, <laughs> be in the chorus. <laughs> this your advice is your autobiography. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my advice is um, oh, set, the bar, set the bar low early, uh -huh. uh, and then you can fulfill your potential later on, and it'll it'll just it'll feel right. <laughs> <laughs> Lower Don't your own expectations. Too early. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, we, we also get a return of Guinan because uh, Wesley's in 10 forward setting traps and she's like, I run a clean place. He's like, right. No offense, but I let something loose on the show. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Uh oh, just like my buddy. You know his name? Frankenstein. Yeah, it's just oh, a science project, yeah. right? Well, that's what Victor said. Uh, yeah, yeah. Look where that happened. <laughs> Oh so man, but that's actually a good point because that's also when Wesley says, "You know, I always get an A," which is like, well, yeah. So did Doctor Frankenstein. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Guinan's <laughs> full of wisdom and good points and uh, quips about her ex husbands <laughs> and how they couldn't contain her, just like a trap won't contain these nanites. I'm right. curious to how many kits she has. Uh, later on, she's it. like, how, "How many kits? Yeah, a oh, lot." Oh, I have a theory. 
<laughs> she birthed the whole Q continuum. Oh, whoa. You're welcome. Okay. She said she did like a wink and a nod when she said, I have a lot of children. Okay. And one of them rebelled. <laughs> I lo- Well, one of them. I mean, the continuum is multiple, right? Like the, or is it an endless? One wouldn't listen. Uh, mm. Oh, okay. I see where you're going. Oh, interesting. interesting. Oh, Becca. Should it be? Oh. <laughs> I you're think, welcome. I don't know if it was already established or not. Stitch but... that with needlepoint. You're welcome. Yeah. Sorry, She's Sarah. Elorian, and I think the Q and the Elorian have a past. She said that before, right? Or is that she not... doesn't? I don't think she's named what uh, her race or uh, origin is yet. Got it. Um, but she's hinted that do you know we do know she's old. Yes, right. we do know she's ancient in some way. Q and, like, she... and Elorians both know about Borg. Mm-hmm. 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 They both have experienced the Borg in some way, too. And the computer, oh. in one of their malfunctions, fakes out the bridge by making them think that the Borg are coming for them and have disabled their shields. Very that is like uncool. the meanest trick you could play, computer. You don't fucking joke about no. Borg. No. No. Unclear. Are these malfunctions or is this a nanite fucking with them and it knows? I feel like the nanites are just pushing buttons and things are happening. That I think they go into it and it, the nanites are evolving and just experimenting to see what happens when when they push putting all, pushing all the buttons on the jukebox to see what exactly. happens. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And John Phillips Sousa plays. Right. What a fun little. Uh, series of huge problems uh including mm. like potentially poisoning the bridge like the, the range of things that are both inconvenient like doors opening when they shouldn't and uh deadly like yeah gas in the bridge the life support uh, and the stars and stripes forever mm. i think if they had just marched around the bridge then maybe it would have disabled this because you're supposed <laughs> to march the- when you hear that song pretty sure mm-hmm. So we learn about uh, Wesley's experiment and what they are, and we have a, a big debate. science project. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, a science project. But we have a debate now on our hands, another ethical quandary, which, which we're always famous for with Star Trek, which is like, what constitutes, you know, life in this case? Um, uh, I like this. I think mm-hmm. that we have sort of skirted around this in the past with dealing, dealings with data or other uh, entities that we've found. But I think this Sparkly is Sparkly sand. Right. I think this is we've we've come up against this enough to know that there is sort of a protocol here of like, OK, everybody on the Enterprise is familiar with it. And Dr. Stubbs is taking our like old approach. And I do like that they revisit that with Worf saying like, hey, it is prudent to just eliminate them. We should consider that as a solution. So so they're not throwing that out for morality totally, but they they have a serious discussion about it. Well, well it, there's the morality of saving the crew. If a right. woman or child are, according to Picard, uh, fuck men, uh, if they die, that's on Stubbs' hands yeah. and uh, can't allow it. The uh, We probably could have brought back some of the points we made in Measure of a Man. I, mm-hmm. I'm glad, Xander, you brought up data in this because I kind of hadn't forgot about that comparison. But like they kind of laid out what they qualify as a difference between artificial life and life, I guess. Yeah. Maybe not even artificial like life, sentient, just sentience life. in general, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. I guess because these things evolve, therefore they learn, therefore they can they achieve. think, achieve. therefore they are. Yeah. yeah, right, yeah. The Descartes thing, right? Exactly. Well, you know, Data has a solution for everything. And it's like, oh, well, I have an app for that. So how about <laughs> I just download it and then we can understand their language. I am the app for that. Them. Yeah, And then it's like, oh, oh, my God. Well, um, they can talk, but, like, how are they going to do it? How about we download them into my brain and then you can talk to me? Any reason to get Brent Spiner acting some more that's, is great. That's exactly what I was thinking. Like, as soon as as soon as they went into his brain and he did, a, like, a different posture, I was like, oh, right, it's another Brent Spiner character. Yeah. I think this was a great way to elevate the opening of the season was, like, how do we show we've made some changes and there's going to be – there was a very heightened dramatic tension when the nanites are downloaded into Brent Spiner's brain because he is so committed and he can do that turn on a dime so mm-hmm. well that – We've seen before, but they're like, "How do we make a banger first step?" That's how you give do him it. a new character. <laughs> Let's well, put him in Data's brain. 
a plot point we skipped over is that Stubbs killed a bunch right. of the nanites with his gamma radiation, yes. and they they tried to stop him, but it's too late. So now he has like an uh, an atrocity is committed on this new uh, species. So he has to answer for that, and that's a real moment of tension because when Data comes alive as the ambassadorial voice for this species, I was kind of afraid for the mm -hmm. for Stubbs. I was like, all it takes is Data just like boop, and you're dead. <laughs> like well, I totally had like. Like two thoughts on this, uh, at, like simultaneously. But one is like Doctor Stubbs being the internet troll that, that had hid behind like the animosity or anonymity, uh, and then was confronted on it, like doxed and like, oh, you can see where I work. I'm so sorry. I never meant any of that that mm. I did. Yeah, um, there's an interesting exchange where he says, "I'm at your mercy," and right. nanites and data are all. What does that mean? Does <laughs> and that Picard, mean I kill you like you killed our other nanites? Right? And Picard steps in and says, uh, forgiveness. Forgiveness yeah, is what yeah. Lucy's looking for. Not the mercy thing. Don't. Mm -mm. But alternatively, I had the thought of like, okay, let's say I like get rid of a colony of ants like in my apartment. And then all of a sudden I'm put on trial and I'm like, I did. I killed all of them. I'm so sorry. It's just what I do. <laughs> you know what That's I mean? That's karma like, I right there. Answer. Yeah. I mean – it always, uh, yeah, it always kind of brings up the scenario of like what happens if some celestial being is out in space and like turns out that our solar system is in their living room and right. they're like, Ugh, I need to move this away. And they just throw us into a black hole, you know? No, oh, no, right we got Marie condo in space. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't spark joy. There's a giant no. eye looking at us like, you've brought me joy and I thank you. And then no, it's two awesome eyes and oblivion. a mouth on a big star field. <laughs> oh, no. Well, the nanites did get back at Stubbs a little bit before we get to the possession scene um, because mm -hmm. he's having more baseball dreams and he gets <laughs> zapped in the brain. Because they so know it's kinda, who he is. Yeah, it's almost take it's almost one for one, tit for tat. Yeah. They uh the malfunctions they there was a deleted scene where actually so, um the malfunctions affected I think one of the nurses in sick bay where like it shocked her too. And I think they wisely took it out because it needed to show that their anger was intention. directed. Yeah, it was intentional. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Sucks yeah, yeah. for that guest star though yeah <laughs> well actually i think it was the nurse i don't know if you guys noticed her but she was the nurse who was in sick bay when they who has the same haircut as bev crush yes uh well it's like a blonde um yeah, yeah but but she, she was involved in every single thing that happened in that scene like when they noticed something was wrong with the food malfunction you can see her in the background being like uh -huh. what's <laughs> going on what's going on over there she's, she's like she's definitely committing to everything you can also see, uh, mentioning this, the bridge officers have the new uniforms, but everybody else kind of has the, or not bridge, the senior officers, everybody else has the, like, old uniforms. Yeah. I'm sure they had them in costume stores. I think that's got to be a budget thing, right? So, like, they had to custom make these new ones for people. I, I know that, I I know they actually get even newer uniforms halfway mm -hmm. through this season, I think, because of breathability, which mm -hmm. I, what I read they somewhere in, in half, here. I think. Yeah, like, and what I read somewhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what I read in somewhere in here was that um, they cost like three thousand dollars. Sure. Yeah. yeah. So like, oh. I'm sure they couldn't like get a bunch of them for every background. So it's like, all right, you get the season two stuff. Sorry, it's sweaty. Yeah. yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> <But> also, <laughs> Sorry, it's sweaty. They didn't even wash it. Yeah. Uh, I have family members that are in at least the U.S. military, and they were they say like uh, uniforms get updated and reused and recycled all the time. So you'll see. You know, and of course, the Star Trek model was based off of like the Navy or the Marines or whatever. Mm -hmm. So that's how they justify like we can do new colors, new uniforms, whatever we want, because it happens. <laughs> totally. We've been kind of a little manic on this episode. I mean, yeah. I'm always manic, but there's some episodes and some or, sorry, some scenes and some relationships I want to highlight. So when we first find out what the nanites are and mommy's like, hey, I can tell you what it is. No reason. And Wesley's like, it me. Um, mm. then that's when Stubbs first says, I would rather everyone on the starship die than lose my mission. Yeah. So don't fuck with me. And Picard's like, okay. Yeah, oh, well, <laughs> I hear you. <laughs> yeah. And then I love, um, so this is the first time we see an interaction between Troy and Stubbs, and then they have another scene later. Mm -hmm. And in this scene, he has a really great line at Troy, which is, no offense, counselor, turn off your beam into my soul. I will share the feelings I wish to share, mm -hmm. which is something we've kind of mentioned before. It's like, it's kind of invasive for her to mm -hmm. go to, go around sniffing out everybody's feelings all the time, when sometimes we put a wall there for a reason. 
Yeah. yeah, that elevated him in a in an interesting way. Like it wasn't just him being like mean to her. It was like, hey, uh, I'm establishing like a barrier here of respect, right. and like I think it's a fair criticism to yeah. give her. And, I, and she didn't object to it either. So right. I like that. Yeah. Yeah, I guess um, sometimes I I hate the villains of the week because they're so caricature mm. but he even though he was dislikable felt like a real person at least for the first half of the episode he may have gotten a little mm-hmm. evil yeah. towards the end yeah. when he destroyed the nanites but i think room. like his obsession kind of carried over to the point to where he did a drastic choice and they justified it so well i agree with you becca i feel like he was more realistic in a lot of ways than some of our uh, earlier season antagonists I-, I feel like the writing in general just got a little crisper Mm. Um, mm. They, they they definitely have tightened things up a little bit, and it's 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 been a little a little less uh, hokey is a little strong of a word, but uh, ham yeah yeah, uh, yeah ham handed a little bit, and they 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 take their time and they explore things a little nicer. I I really like that. I think we're gonna see that more in season three, which mm. I hope to explore. Coming into the, ta- to the end of this, I was I made the note that I'm really happy that diplomacy wins for once. Uh, I know that we've like, especially in the past, we've talked about negotiating and diplomacy, but it always ends in some sort of ship to ship combat or a phaser fight or something. And this like diplomacy was actually working and it was the solution, which I thought was a really great uh, message to give. Have we in the Middle East is possible. (laughs) Have we always concluded that? I don't know. Always, but it was nice to get the win for diplomacy so early on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we didn't really have like a major action scene or battle, and no, nor did we need it, right? Right. Yeah, Yeah. it didn't feel like it was lacking. Yeah, and a lot of times, whatever invader or foreign entity becomes the aggressor and is becomes the enemy to the mm-hmm. enterprise, um, and they always seem like they're taking the higher road. Whereas, of course, Picard did a great do- job mediating and negotiating between the creatures in Data's mind and Stubbs, and you know, getting that apology and figuring out that they're going to get a new planet. Mm-hmm. Um, but, but it wasn't humans know best right. no it's mistakes were made on both sides yeah 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 that's and i think it was the acknowledgement and the, the of course brent spiner's amazing acting of of working with like a raw understanding of these like nanites because they don't know these social customs they don't know pride they don't know these other things and to like for pure rational argument you know they let things go i think this theme shows the show's evolution <laughs> <laughs> Bam! Drop the episode title. No one saw it coming. <laughs> the okay. customs thing is a good point. Oh, go ahead. Sorry about that. I know we're at the end, but I still want to talk about the scene with Troy when she goes to Stubbs' quarters uh-huh. and calls him the fuck out. Uh, he's all brassy for a second and like, oh, you've seen my bad side, but I'm going to champagne you up later, girly. Yeah. What a <laughs> gross like, line. Yeah, she's like, um, okay, well, let me just say that your self-portrait is stretched so tight that this tension fills the room, and if you finally fail, it's going to snap. <laughs> what a good line. Such a – I mean, speaking of the tighter writing, as you put it, Jake, mm, yeah. totally, yeah. totally tight like the tension in the room. So um, like- and then he comes back with, like, deep down behind a man's self-portrait, as you call it. Sometimes there's nothing there, lady, nothing. so don't fuck with my self-portrait. <laughs> I don't know what that means. Like, there's no hidden passage behind to like find. Like, there's no deeper meaning. Yeah, the analogy gets. Yeah, yeah. I think it's my obsession is all I am. So don't tell me not to be obsessed. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I kind of was initially like a little turned off by her her way of laying it out like there by him. Excuse me. I was a little turned off by her, the way she laid it out to him like that because it's not Wait, very. No one's ever been turned off by Marina. <laughs> <laughs> but I totally agree with you. Like she did flat out call out what is his issue, which is what the role of a counselor is on a TV show as well. Like again, breaking the fifth wall a little or fourth wall a little bit here is like mm-hmm. we need someone to like lay it out to him, and this is yeah. she's the best person to execute that, and that, the way she did it was great. Not only Um, that, but uh, like within the story as well, being a counselor on the flagship starship, you know, these are the best officers. They're all like this. Everyone is a Vunderkind. Yeah. (laughs) So she's used to dealing with this. Yeah. I just wonder if like in the 24th century, like the counselors are just like, all right, we're going to give them one session to get through it. Then we're going to lay it out for them. (laughs) (laughs) You get a warning shot and then it's for the jugular. (laughs) (laughs) 
You know, it's like uh, free medical care, free mental health care. Take them up imagine? on it, you know? <laughs> uh, well, that was evolution. Any other things we missed before we move on? Oh, just a quick shout out to Guinan and Crusher. I want all the scenes of them together forever. Thank you. Oh, oh yeah. Well, uh, we got to talk about the ending cutesy scene. Yeah. Please. Yeah. Xander? Oh, just a, well, it was <laughs> a little it heteronormative, up. but that's okay. But Wesley comes in with an 80s chick. Uh, and <laughs> and Beverly's like, yes, this is normal. Good, it's happening. Wait a second, and then pulls the like trope of. Uh, 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 what do you know about this girl? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it was it was pretty it cute, was cute, but I agree. A little cringy hetero heteronormative. He comes in with like a blonde babe with yeah. his arm around her, right? And that seems like a little like. Hold on, Wesley. We want you to be respect social, women. but we don't. Yeah, we want you to respect women. <laughs> I so, like, remember when. Teenagers in the hallways were always in in high school, just always all over each other in every opportunity they could be. Like that was so real to me. Yeah, yeah. I made out in the dark room with one guy <laughs> like a lot. Right, right. It's and only made out in the photography dark room for the semester that I was in a co-ed school. Yes, um, <laughs> <laughs> I would yeah. be terrified to make out at, at school. I guess I did a little it's bit. It's a right. dark room, James. No, I, there were theater classes. You're right. I get it. <laughs> yeah. And if Miss Hilvitz finds you in there, she's not going to get mad at you. <laughs> Shout out to Miss Hilvitz, listener. <laughs> I've, I've Googled her recently just to make sure she's she's still chill. <laughs> yeah, okay, audience, remember, Google your high school teachers. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Um, there, I also just wanted to bring up the image of uh, 90s teenagers with jeans and their hands in each other's jean pocket. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. right there. <laughs> Yep. Very related to everything going on with this episode. <laughs> I'm so glad we've evolved past that. Well, we, we get to see there is like a mother son dynamic because he's like the only crew member whose mom is on the ship. And like, yeah, that's a thing for sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and we'll see more of it for sure. Um, but we'll start seeing more of it with the next episode called The Ensigns of Command. Mm -hmm. That's what? where Data must convince a colony of people to evacuate their planet because the aliens who own the planet are coming home. Dun, dun, dun. Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we should end it on is uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh oh. Uh -oh. <laughs> Bye. See you next week. Bye. Bye. <laughs>